Film Center, hundreds of films go out every day, 1,200 or more each week, and that's nearly 60,000 a year. Quite big business, except that it's free. Most of the Melbourne and Metropolitan borrowers collect and return their films at our counter. We're easily found right opposite that excellent, if somewhat unsightly, landmark, the Chimney of the City Baths. With so many film loans to record, the booking section can't afford to make mistakes, so every film has its own booking card with all the days of the year marked on it. Every borrowing group has its own number. And when a film is booked, we can tell by a glance at the card when it's clear for the next borrower. Once the booking's made, we send word to the borrower that certain films have been booked for his group. Uh, we do this with a, a form we call a dispatch advice notice. And this lists the films and shows the date they're due out and the date they're due back. And a copy of this notice is kept to help the dispatch men gather the films from the racks. These are film history cards. Every film has one. We know from it how many screenings it's had and what marks and splices are on it each time it's loaned. Records of this kind are, are very necessary because damage does sometimes occur to films. Fortunately, not very often. Our dispatch men collect the films for each program from steel racks which have tops on them and are kept very clean. Each film is kept separately in a tightly fitting can because dust is the enemy of films. The uh, programs for the metropolitan borrowers go down to the counter in this little trolley, but those for the country uh, are pampered a little and they're packed in fibre cases ready for the journeys all around Victoria by rail. There are 1,600 borrowing groups registered with us. At least half of them are in the country. And the centre's little van is quite a familiar sight around the city each day on its way to dispatch and collect at Flinder Street and Spencer Street railway stations. My name's David Swift. I'm a public servant and I take care of the State Film Library. This library is part of the Premier's Department and I'm responsible to the head of that department, Sir John Jungworth. But our policy is shaped by the Victorian Documentary Film Council, which meets under Sir John's chairmanship. It was the forerunner of this council which set the State Film Centre up some 15 years ago. And there's quite an interesting story behind that. It goes back to the early days of the last war, when the fighting services were looking anxiously for every possible training aid. And they found perhaps the best one of all in these 16 millimeter films, which were small, which could easily be taken from place to place, and which were crammed full of inf information. And with their help, men and women were fitted for jobs they never dreamed they'd ever do. And another thing was found that the feature documentaries from Britain and America helped to build morale. They showed people what they were fighting for. And when the war was finished, the documentary enthusiasts went to governments and said, look what a wonderful job these films did during the war. Don't let it all slump now. Let's form documentary film libraries here and, and put film to work in the post-war years. And government saw the point and the value of this and many of them agreed. And in Australia, the Australian National Film Board was set up in 1945, and the Commonwealth Government called on the states for help. They, they asked if the states would set up agencies. 
and in Victoria, the State Film Centre was set up as our agency and that was in June 1946. Uh, we started off with just one rack of film, but a lot of hopes for the future. And in this case, they were realised very quickly uh, with a happy combination of good government support and generous support and also very vigorous borrowing from the public right from the beginning. And before very long, we had the largest of all the state film libraries. Today we have eight and a half thousand films and we circulate them at the rate of nearly 60,000 a year. And our borrowers are spread right through Victoria. We have our farmers groups and we have our 60 film societies. We have our business and industrial groups. We have the youth groups, including the scouts and the guides. We have our parent associations. We have our art groups and music groups. We have uh, a whole body of trade union and church groups and then schools. Lots of schools ranging right from kindergarten level through to university standard. They take these films from the library quite free of charge because the films belong to the people of Victoria. Any group may borrow them and they do borrow them most vigorously. The films go from our racks just like hot scones melting away on a, uh, at an afternoon tea party. And the subjects are very varied indeed and to show you something of this variety, we propose now to screen three small excerpts from some of the films on our shelves. Uh, and the first one will be from Canada. It's called Rhythmetic. It's a, a frolicsome little thing by Norman McLaren, who's quite famous now and has a worldwide following. And it's a National Film Board of Canada production, uh, an organisation, this is one, that produces some of the finest documentaries in the world today. The next segment is quite a different kind of film. It comes from Britain. It's from the Central Office of Information and it's called Caribbean. It shows something of the life in the West Indies. It shows people uh, going about their work. It shows them at carnival time. It even in the course of the film shows something of their social problems. But I think you'll see from the excerpt we show that it's gaining information with a smile. It's a very gay little film. Two to eat, twelve o'clock, let's break the park. The next one's from Britain too, another Central Office of Information film. This time it's called Come Saturday. It uh, tells in various ways the manner in which the Englishman enjoys his precious Saturday afternoon. It shows something else too. It shows the warm, very human, very humorous approach to documentary which has made British documentary very famous.
he's not very happy. I wish we could show you more of the incidents of that kind in the film. As we obtain our films from all parts of the world, you may be wondering how we find them. Well now, that's one of the jobs that Edwin Sheffley must do. He's our information officer, and he's been finding the best films for years. Film purchasing is, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of our work at the Film Centre, because it brings us into contact with many overseas countries. Not only do we buy films from the main producing countries, such as Britain, America and Canada, but we buy films from all sorts of other places. We buy films from France, we buy experimental films from Poland, uh, puppet films from Czechoslovakia, we buy from Belgium, Holland, uh, Israel, South Africa, and closer to home, places like New Zealand. Each year we spend a considerable amount of money on buying films, and our purchase program is approved by our Documentary Film Council. This covers like something like 500 new films each year, which is quite a lot of film. This year we're endeavouring to obtain as many films as possible from Asian countries. We've already received uh, a consignment of films from the Malayan Film Unit. We've just recently ordered a group of films from the Indian Government Film Department. And at present we're negotiating for a new series of films produced in Japan. The Japanese films are rather expensive to purchase, but they're of a very high technical standard, and we're certainly looking forward to obtaining these for our library. Every year, we spend quite a fair proportion of our film purchasing money on buying films for schools. Through these films, uh, the remotest corners of the globe, uh, the great scientific achievements, and the great personalities of our time are brought right into the classroom. Um, we would like to show you just a, a short section of one of these films, a quite famous production called Instruments of the Orchestra, in which Sir Malcolm Sargent introduces students to the music of Benjamin Britten and the playing of the London Symphony Orchestra. Now, it's not usual for a conductor to talk during a concert, but this time I'm going to name each instrument and tell you something about it before it plays. And I've placed them so that you may see them clearly. Now, the sounds in an orchestra are produced in three different ways, by the musicians either blowing, scraping, or banging. Well, first of all, let's hear them all together. are made of wood and are called the wood wind. The other blowing instruments are made of brass and they naturally are called the brass. There we have a very good example of the type of film which we are purchasing for use in schools. Once we finally receive a film from overseas or from a local producer, it must go through a whole variety of processes before it's ready for distribution to our borrowers. Firstly, it must be catalogued. Our librarian looks after our extensive reference library and when we receive a new film, she prepares a catalogue entry which includes information on the subject content of the film, its running time, date of production, whether it's black and white or colour and other details. We're rather proud of the reference library which includes, among other things, some rare collector's items. We receive from all over the world books, periodicals and publicity material on new films and from this mass of information we select films for purchase which we think will be of interest to our borrowing groups. To protect a new film from damage, we process it on one of our lubricating machines, which spread a thin layer of oil over the surface of the film. 
This prolongs the life of a film. In fact, we have one or two titles in our library which have been screened as many as 600 times. With careful projecting, we normally expect a film still to be in fairly good condition after 200 screenings. Next, the film is inspected for any damage, and here we see our senior film inspector checking a print and repairing a damaged section. Once the film is in distribution, it is carefully checked between every screening to ensure it is kept in good condition. A print may cost anything from £7 to £70 for a 10 minute production, and so we are always on the lookout for careless projectionists and faulty equipment which could cause further damage. A long colour film could cost as much as £300, and this could be ruined in one screening on a faulty projector. With the current turnover of films, we keep five inspection girls very busy coping with the films as they are returned by borrowers. One of the most hard-pressed pieces of equipment in our office is our printing machine. We feel at the centre that it's not much use having a library of eight and a half thousand films unless these are used as extensively as possible. And so our printing machine and our collating machine are kept busy producing a wide range of film lists, information sheets and program leaflets which are mailed frequently to community groups all over Victoria. The Film Centre has a dual role, firstly to collect films and secondly to promote their widest possible use. One way of promoting our films is through our publication section. Another way in which we promote our film is by presenting free public screenings. These may be arranged on a wide variety of subjects. One day it may be a program of new films for farmers. On another occasion it may be an evening on space exploration. Perhaps it may be an open air screening of films on art subjects being presented as part of the Moomba, film, Moomba Festival. Or it may be a six night season of Australian films presented as part of the Melbourne Film Festival. We get quite a great deal of pleasure from arranging these programs, um, but the actual really hard work of putting the film on a screen is the responsibility of our technical section, which is in charge, uh, of which Mr Rod Power is in charge of. We're all right for equipment nowadays, but there was a time when transport in particular was very scarce indeed. And uh, at this particular time, in the early days, we even called upon the family pram to uh, dis carry up our equipment from place to place. Needless to say, we didn't get very far. However, uh, transport soon arrived after the publication of that photograph, and uh, the transport was very, very necessary because we had to cart around uh, motion picture projectors like this 16 millimeter projector that you see here, uh, the loudspeaker, screen, and quite a lot of other ancillary equipment which was necessary to put on a good screening. Now the projectionist has quite a responsibility. He is responsible for the audience's comfort. That is to say that uh, he's got to make sure that the hall is tidy, that uh, there's, um, if it's a cold night, he's got to make sure that there aren't any uh, windows left open and he can't always control this but he does his best and he's also got to see that there are no breakdowns mechanically or with any of the equipment that is around the uh, or associated with the presentation of the show and this brings us to the point that the projectionist is a good showman if he's a good showman he considers his audience in this way that he tries to transport his audience transport them from the seats that they're sitting in to a new situation, to a situation of them being present in the place on the screen. They want to leave this theatre, forget they're in a theatre, and realise that they're in a new world, the world that's being presented to them via the film. In city areas, projectionists have no significant problems, but in some areas he has real ones. In remote country districts, there is often no power supply, and to meet this situation, the projectionist takes with him a trailer generator set. This is a petrol-electric unit, 
giving two and a half kilowatts sufficient electricity for the projector and for the lighting of the hall. As he is dependent upon so much equipment, projectors, amplifiers, petrol engines, electric generator sets and motor vehicles, it is obvious that an efficient service department is essential. Technical maintenance is carried out in a well-equipped workshop where the service of electronic sound equipment mechanical projection equipment, motor vehicles and all the varied equipment necessary for the presentation of films and the efficient running of a film library can be maintained. Upon the efficient running of equipment rests the illusion of the motion picture itself. And here another facet of the centre presents itself, film production. Film making is in the strictest sense make-believe a trick, an illusion. When a motion picture is being made, the camera analyzes the movement. Now, the, the pictures are taken by the camera at a rate of 24 pictures per second. And these pictures are still pictures. Let us say, for instance, if I uh, demonstrate a movement by raising my hand above my head and lowering it, when the camera photographs that, it takes a series of 24 pictures in the second time that that took to accomplish, and it would look something like this, a series of jerky photographs if we looked at them one after the other, and not much use on their own. But when they are projected, the projector reconstitutes this movement by projecting them at a rate of 24 pictures per second, the same rate as was shown in the camera here, and we're able to see them reconstituted on the screen. Let's have a look how the camera takes these pictures frame by frame. Normally the camera is operated by an electric motor, but in this case we'll hand operate it to show you the frame by frame movement. Here we see the film go moving through picture by picture as the photographs are taken. Very slowly now, but naturally it's when the uh, electric motors driving it very very quickly indeed 24 per second in other words each picture really is being taken in 1 50th of a second this is all very excellent and tells the story quite well but why is it that we can see pictures in this way primarily because our eye has an effect known as persistence of vision and our eye melts all these individual pictures together and makes them just one whole we can also create a mood with pictures as well as showing reality. Planning and editing comes into this particular situation. Now supposing we photograph a small lad uh, running along the street and he's being chased by a policeman. We can show it in two pictures, perhaps the policeman first and then the small boy running. We establish here the idea of fear. Now some subjects in nature already have a mood within them themselves. And some little while ago we were making a film at Wilson's Promontory for the State Film Centre, a film called At the Land's End. And we noticed there that nature had an atmosphere all of her own. And in one of the interesting scenes of this was a, an amazing natural phenomenon. This phenomenon of the smoking cliffs was taken at Derby River. This is the land's end, the southernmost part of Australia, a place of unspoiled beauty and of breathtaking strangeness.
in our work, we have the help of ten regional film libraries. These are scattered through the larger country centres in Victoria, and they're the big municipal book libraries. This combination of films and books is a very interesting one, and it works out very well. The films, like the books, have become quite a part of the everyday life for lots of people in Victoria, and with films, we're able to open many windows on the world, as Ed Sheffley told you earlier, we're able to, to cross national barriers. Uh, documentary film is quite international. We go into other lands and we meet people and then they can come and meet us. This whole movement is, is a wonderfully valuable and wonderfully stimulating one. It's changing all the time and in this state at the moment one of the changes is in the uh, movement towards the formation of film appreciation groups in schools. This is a very important movement. It's part of a worldwide one, and we're budgeting quite a lot of money this year to buy films specially for school use. We think that in the hands of skilled teachers, uh, the boys and girls will really be able to learn good film from bad. And if the movement grows widely enough, there's very little doubt that it will help in the future to substantially influence the standards of both cinema and television. And the films that the boys and girls like are very frequently the films that the adults like too. And our final example this evening is one uh, from Australia. It's a film called Two Boys and a Boat, a very charming one, made round Sydney Harbour by the Commonwealth Film Unit, which is under the supervision of Stanley Hawes, one of the pioneers of the documentary film movement. Oh, you can go out by yourselves this afternoon. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.